Assuming you're doing a study and you want to get statistically significant results, then you ideally would do a sample size calculation. And so I, I just want to sort of go through the main factors that go into that, the key factors. The first one, which I think is often the hardest one people find to get their heads around, is the size of the difference that you want your study to be able to detect. And sometimes that's given by delta, which is a Greek symbol in the formulae. And people will say to me, well, I don't know what size of difference I'm going to get. But that doesn't really matter. It's what size of difference would be important if it occurred. For example, a 50% decrease in gene expression. Is that, if you're, that was the true underlying effect, would you want your study to be able to show that? If it was only 20%, would it be important for your study to show that? So that's something you need to decide in advance what's important. What, if the difference was there, would I want to be able to detect it in the study? So um, that's not something that you need to have measured before. You just need to sort of know what you would like to see if it was there. Significance level, I mean, usually that's just taken to be the 5% significance level seen as what you need for statistical significance. So um, you don't usually need to think any more about that. The next concept, which is specific sample size calculation, is the, um, the power. That's often denoted by the Greek symbol beta. So the power is that it's the chance of detecting a statistically significant result if you've got this size of difference. So if the true underlying decrease in gene expression, for example, was 50%, and I do my study with this many animals, how likely am I to be able to get a significant result? Because, of course, you never know exactly what's going to happen in your experiment. There's random variability. You want to have a good chance of getting that significant result. And typically, the power people use is 80% is or 90%. So it's seen that a study is satisfactory if you've got 80 or 90% chance of getting your result as significant. If you go much less than 80%, you might argue, well, is the study really worth doing if I've only got 50% chance of achieving statistical significance? There's 50-50 that all my study and possibly animals are going to have been wasted. And the thing you will have to put into the calculation that can be quite hard to get, given you haven't done your study, is you want to measure the variability of the data. So you'll need the standard deviation of the data. But quite often, if it's a measurement, if your primary endpoint is a measurement that's been taken in other studies, in similar situations, even if it's not your study, there will be, in the literature, you might be able to find details of what the standard deviation is. Even if it's just a sort of plot where, with error bars, you can get a, a sort of rough estimate of what that is. And that's often better than just doing nothing at all, you, rather than saying, I just don't have any estimates of the standard deviation, I can't do a sample size calculation. You can be sort of creative in using what's available in publications if you don't have that estimate from previous studies yourself. Or even if it's a previous study in a slightly different situation, it can still be a valid estimate of a standard deviation to incorporate. And quite often standard deviations are given by the, the Greek symbol sigma, so it's worth getting used to these symbols because they go into the formulae. So there are the four ingredients that um, go into sample size calculation. So the first one you just need to think about Second to significance level is usually obvious. The power, you just need to decide do I want to be, how certain you want to be about getting your significant result. And then you do need an estimate of the standard deviation of your primary endpoint. This is the basic formula for calculating the number of samples you need per group. So you'll see these things that I described are all in the formula. You've got the delta, which is the side of, size of a difference to detect, the minimal effect that's of interest to you, standard deviation. Alpha and beta come into these Z statistics, which I'll explain in a minute. Basically, the Z statistics are points on what's known as a normal distribution required to, to give the required power and significance. So that I'll show those in a second. They're not really difficult to see. They're actually fixed values you can just put in, so it's not really making the formulae that much more difficult. This formula is most suitable when the data are normally distributed. It's for continuous data. 
obviously in some situations you think your data are probably not going to be normally distributed or you don't know they're going to be normally distributed. And unfortunately, there's no ideal formulae for when you're in that situation. So it's probably even in that situation, it's best to use this formula because it'll turn out to be conservative if you have got non-normal data. If you were to use this formula and the data are non-normal, you're going to get a larger number of animals than you might find that you actually need in practice to get statistical significance because non-normal data tends to have quite a high variability. There might be sort of outlying values or values at the limit of the range of the distribution. So I would still consider using that even if you don't think your data are normal. Unless, of course, you can transform it using a log transformation or something to be more symmetrically or normally distributed. So this, um, Z, these Z statistics that went into the formulae, just to give a bit of background as to where they come from, they come from the standard normal distribution. This is a plot of the normal distribution, and the Z statistics are determined by the point where the area here is going to be equal to, say, the required power. So you'd want 90% of the area to be in this point to get the Z statistic for 90% power. So, but if beta was 80%, you wanted 80% power, Z would be a little bit lower to denote that. And the same thing for, um, for significance, we have to sort of consider, well, I won't go into the details, but basically we have to say 1 minus the significance level over 2. So what we're looking for then is the point on the normal distribution where 97.5% of the area or probability is here. So the Z sort of moves along a bit. We've got um, a higher value of Z for a 5% significance level. These values are calculated by statistical software. Uh, so you don't need to sort of think about using tables as people did in the past. And in fact, you don't need to think that much about it at all because typically you're dealing with 5% significance. And it's well known that the Z value relating to that is 1.96. That's the value that gets used for 95% confidence intervals as well. And for 80% power and 90% power, the values uh, sort of you can just take those from what's already known 0.84 and 1.28 so basically these are the z values for most situations that need to go into to this formulae up here so um, you don't need to sort of worry too much about those and thinking about how on earth am I going to find out what the appropriate value of z is.